So I come from Capo Inge, northern New Mexico area, also known as Santa Cruz Pueblo, where we uh, have lived since time immemorial. Um, we're fortunate that in our communities, um, unlike a lot of native people of this continent, we were able to stay on our ancestral homelands. Um, unlike a lot of native people that got relocated uh, from their their place, uh, we still have remained where we've always been. And so it's really the reason why I do the work that I do, because um, that's where my spirit belongs. And we all have that place where our spirit is rooted, um, where we feel connect that connection to. And like we learned earlier, um, the way we honor that connection and how we are in that in that place that we exist um, is everything. And honoring that lineage of everyone who's come before us. So. Uh, and that picture is me when I'm pregnant with um, my third child, um, nine months pregnant. And uh, so much of that image is about the work that we do in our environmental health and justice program because, like uh, Melina stated, you can't, you can't, um, our health is connected to the health of the land. Any violence enacted on Mother Earth is a violence against women and girls. And we have to really lift that issue up and make those connections in all the work that we do, um, especially with indigenous women and girls. And if we can lift that, that spirit up in all our work, um, everyone is going to be benefited. Everyone is going to be protected from putting those future generations central to all our decision making. So we're... I grew up kind of disconnected from a lot of the environmental issues that we face in our community. And it wasn't until I had children of my own and brought them back um, home to our, our village that, you know, wanting to teach them more of their culture and, um, and love of place that I grew up with. And so I was home and I started to, just in this, blissful cloud of homecoming and walking by the river one morning um, which we call Posonge and behind behind me is uh, Tunjo, one of our, our sacred mesas um, that marks, marks territories between us and a neighboring uh, Pueblo. So we were walking by the river one morning and I just heard this, it was about six in the morning and I just heard this like rumbling uh, through the landscape and my first instinct was just to like where's this rain like what's what is that and um, the lady I was walking with she was like it's the bombs they're testing in Los Alamos and uh, walked a little bit more and we heard it that big rumble again um, and talking about the danger of the earth shaking us off well, we're already causing that shaking um, through a lot of ways. And so it was a moment where I couldn't, neither one of us could speak. I was just crying. Uh, my whole little blissful homecoming was shattered. And it's my first instinct was to actually run home and like, we got to move. Um, I had never realized what had been happening up um, in our hillside all, all my life growing up. Part of environmental racism is the exploitation of a work, cheap workforce where people aren't going to protest the kind of job creation that happens in our communities. So all of our family works there, all of, um, all of us have family that worked up there and they're not going to really talk bad about their job because we're hardworking people, um, we take pride in our work. And so I think that's why it wasn't ever talked about in a way that was critical or that I was able to overhear. And instead of moving, I put it out there in prayer, like, what should I do? And a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call 
from Table Women United if I was interested in facilitating a community group around environmental justice issues around Los Alamos National Laboratory issue, um, impacts. So I was like, oh, okay, creator. <laughs> um, and so that was nine years ago, and I've been doing this work since then. And it's put me in a position where I've been really fortunate to have uh, mentors and elders to help me on that journey. So, um, two of them who are here with me today, Vicki and Marion, um, who have also been working on these issues way longer than I have, probably 25 years plus. And so I've had the opportunity to learn and have that mentorship. And I feel like I finally, nine years later, scratched the surface on a lot of these things where I'm able to speak about them to other people. That's not things you're not learned about Pico Curies in school. You're not taught about um, strontium and chromium and all the 300 plus chemicals they release into the environment. We're not taught about environmental regulations and permit processes and um, all these kind of areas of, unless you go into, you know, environmental studies, you're not going to know about them. And maybe that's another reason my people never spoke about it because they didn't have that, felt like they had that understanding um, that because they also have that internalized oppression where it's been taught that traditional native knowledge doesn't have the equal value of scientific knowledge. And, and uh, our regulatory agencies hold up that scientific knowledge over any kind of traditional knowledge still to this day. And so for that reason, we're um, the process of trying to fight these contamination of our homelands is actually disempowering most of the time because we're going into spaces that are um, sexist, racist, um, all those isms and oppressions that we, I'm sure all of you are aware of and that we'll also talk about more tomorrow. So, um, in our homelands on the Hemis Plateau, which is the western part of our, our cathedral, our Tewa world, is where the labs were set up um, through eminent domain, through military force. The militarization of Native peoples is something that continues on to this day. And so even though we got to, to keep our ancestral homelands, our water is getting poisoned, our land is getting extracted, um, we have health impacts that aren't even being studied, that we have to prove the harm that's happening before anything can happen, but yet we don't have that scientific backing or resources to do that, so it's this constant like catch-22 cycle. And um, if you could imagine that whole, this whole room full of barrels of nuclear waste, that's what it's like for us to have a nuclear waste dump up in our um, Hemis Mountains, in our Hemis Plateau where these labs are, lo are located. And uh, it's a lot of issues. Um, our water is threatened to where we're a desert. We live in the desert. We have a sole source aquifer which means that half of the population in New Mexico is dependent on that aquifer for their water. So the, the poisoning of that water would displace half of um, the people that are living there right now if, it, if we don't take action to protect that water. So it really brings me um, a lot of hope when I come to these gatherings and, and we're, we have these ceremonies about water and um, that makes me have hope that things are shifting and that, um, that consciousness is shifting. So the big part about we're doing environmental justice work is also recognizing how it intersects with all of these other social justice issues, how it intersects with our reproductive health and justice. These are some of the only contaminants that can cross placental boundaries um, and impact our, our next generation um, before they're even born. How many am I on time? Okay. <laughs> I'm not keeping track. So, it's just, it's not only the health of our environment, it's our reproductive health, it's our ability to pass on our memories and our traditions to the next generation. And um, 
So we have that campaign to protect those most vulnerable in our communities, where right now the standard for radiation exposure is based on an adult white male. And so that's, again, that's that racism that's uh, still, still um, an obsolete model, but still being used. And right now there's, they're trying to even raise that level of exposure. So if you fall into that 153 pound white male Western European descent and custom, then you might be okay. But if you're a native person that still hunts and fishes, gathers your own plant medicines, is outdoors most of the time, um, catches rainwater, still has that relationship with the land, then um, that even makes that exposure more cumulative and exponential in harm. So it's um, a lot of issues that we're able to have really, but we have a lot of really strong networks that are, um, with our shared expertise, we're able to have a seat at the table, at least for some of these things right now. And that also gives us a lot of hope. Um, this is in the Hemis Plateau at the Valles Caldera, one of our sacred places. There's Mary. <laughs> uh, this is part of our circle of grandmothers at Table Women United who went to um, went to feed the energies of our ancestral homelands instead of feeding the negativity of the, the labs for a change. And um, Marion has been really instrumental in helping in teaching me about how we need to sometimes even giving negative attention to something is still giving it energy, is still feeding it. And so if we go back to feeding our ancestral energies and this here on the, that we have before us, um, they'll help us to, to make the changes that need to happen. And um, so it's being conscious of being in balance with, with what we put our energy toward and how even sometimes just protesting and protesting and protesting, like that's still giving it life and giving it energy. And so if we need to shift that to returning to what really deserves our attention and our energy, and that's our sacred places. Um, our grandmothers, these places that have been neglected for a long time now, that we're reviving that um, intention. So um, I guess I'll end with that for now. Thank you.